It's our privilege today to have with us Reverend Mitch Webb, the director of the Huntington City Mission. This is the second year now we've had Mitch in the month of May, and uh, prior to worship I said I would like to make this an annual uh, thing in May because I think when we have our mission partners in front of us, we're much more intentional about uh, being involved with those missions and, and you know casting support there and being part of it. And what I love about the city mission is that they do things that we necessarily can't do, that we're not equipped to do. And it reminds me of how the body of Christ operates, is that we all have a part to play, we all have a function to play. And when I drive past the city mission, one of the first things I ever noticed when I moved to Huntington here eight years ago was that cross that says, you know what it says on the cross? Jesus saves, Jesus saves, it's just beautiful. Uh, the mission is a vital part of our community and Mitch has just uh, been such a blessing to the mission and our community. One of the things that he and the board came up with a few years ago was the Let's Do Lunch program. And, and he'll talk more about that, but from, from our perspective, I wanted to share that, that uh, because of increased uh, amounts of needs, and I think they went from serving uh, like 30 more thousand meals a year or something like that uh, in the span of one year. Think of that number, 30,000 more approximately that temporarily they had to uh, elim eliminate the lunch program. Now, you and I, we might be able to get away without with missing a meal, right? We can do that. But I think of the children, and children can't miss a meal. And uh, so many children there, and so under Mitch's leadership, the mission adopted the Let's Do Lunch program. Uh, we have been part of it. It's part of our mission budget and outreach at the church. And in fact, in your bulletin today is envelopes for that offering for the Let's Do Lunch program. It's been a huge hit and success. And again, it just, it just makes me feel even more um, like this is my community, my, you know, where I live, where, where, where my faith is practiced. When I look around and see partners in the gospel and doing different parts of the gospel that I can't do and, and I'm not able to do. And so, Mitch, thank you for coming today to share with us. And a few years ago at the uh, fundraiser uh, banquet for the city mission, I heard Mitch preach and I said, man, he's a good preacher. We got to get him here. And so he's graced us now uh, two years in a row and I hope for many more years to come. Mitch, thank you. Welcome again to Christ Presbyterian Church. Well, good morning, folks. It is a pleasure to be back with you. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you uh, so much for your uh, support, uh, particularly of our Let's Do Lunch program. Just so you know, we started back June 4th last year, which was the first Monday after our children at the mission were out of school. And we began serving uh, lunches back then, and we're still going strong today. And uh, just trust in the Lord that we'll still be able to do that tomorrow. And so uh, thank you so much for that. And the monies that you give today, uh, that's, the, uh, that's where we are designating it. That's where it'll be used. Just so you know, it's about $2.08 is the amount of food that we have into, into a lunch. And uh, so that will get you maybe half of a value meal at McDonald's. And uh, so we're just so thankful for your uh, help uh, and your prayers and your support. You know, this uh, body of believers also has uh, uh, two board members, uh, Barbara Charter, and then our, our newest uh, board member, Scott Ramsey. And, uh, and although he's our newest board member, uh, he hasn't just started helping us. He's been doing that for a while. And uh, also you have the Goodwill uh, Ambassador or Ambassadors, as I understand after reading the article in the paper, but my friend Monty Fulton, who has uh, just been a real uh, encouragement to me in my years at the mission. And then there are others of you that uh, uh, we uh, learned, learned to love you over the years and appreciate you. Now, normally I do this uh, update part about the mission and I'm, I'm a former marketing person. Uh, I think that might be kind of like being a former Marine. You're never a former Marine. You're always a Marine. So maybe the same way. But we're trying something different today. We have Jody Dow here. And Jody is our uh, uh, events uh, coordinator. And uh, also the closest thing we have right now. And then one day, by God's grace, we'll be our director of development. And I'm going to have her to come and share about the mission. And then we'll come back and talk about Psalm 23. Jody. Good morning. Um, 
I just want to say um, what an honor and privilege it is to be with you this morning. And um, we so appreciate your um, kindness and generosity that you've given to the mission um, over the years and especially to our Let's Do Lunch program. And I'm just going to briefly update you on what's been going on the last year in some of our programs. And um, so this year, um, the mission is celebrating its 80th anniversary. Um, we began in 1939 as a soup kitchen, and that has continued um, for 80 years. Um, our feeding program is still one of the um, main things that we do. Um, our kitchen serves three meals a day, Monday through Saturday, so breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then we serve two meals on Sunday. Um, last year in 2018, we served 108,000 meals, um, and that is not just for the folks um, who are our guests at the mission, who are staying with us, but it's open to the community. So anyone in Huntington can come and eat. So about 50% of those who come and share a meal with us are um, from the mission, or from the community, sorry. <laughs> and, and about the other 50% are from the mission. Um, and our hope there is that, you know, maybe they have housing, maybe they can afford their rent, but, um, you know, maybe just at the end of the month, they're a little low and, and need some help. And so we're hoping that that kind of helps, um, you know, um, prevent homelessness. But um, not I don't want to just give statistics because we're more than um, about the programs or about the people. So with kind of each program, I have um, some folks who are going to share a story with you from either our staff or some of our guests. Um, and so for our feeding program, if Kyle would share... Yeah, Kyle um, has been with us maybe for about a month now. Um, he's our new kitchen coordinator, and um, he has he had said that he felt like God had really called him to the mission, and um, he'd applied several years ago but didn't get the job, and you know now the opportunity is is there, and he's doing um, wonderful things with our our guests, and um, they're really enjoying him and and the meals, and so we're really blessed to have him. Thank you. Um, so we feed people. We also shelter people. Our shelter is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, for anyone who may find themselves without a place to live or a home. Um, they can come and stay with us. Um, we have facilities for men as well as women and families. Um, so that includes children as well. And about 50% um, of the folks who stay with us are women and children. And, um, you know, there are lots of different reasons people um, become homelessness. Um, it's, you know, sometimes a lot of it has to do with um, addiction or drug use um, or substance use. But um, sometimes folks have just lost their home in a fire or someone has lost their job or um, someone in their family has passed away and they're unable to, you know, continue to pay the bills. Um, so we, you know, offer them a place to stay. And um, if Sherry would share... Thank you. Um, Sherry is one of our newest employees. She um, came to us out of um, prison, and as she said, she was broken. But, um, you know, if you talk to Sherry now, she'll, um, you know, tell you that it's all God that provided this and the blessings. And so when folks come to us, um, you know, we help set them up with a case manager who um, helps them with housing as well as um, finding a job. And we work with a lot of the agencies here in the community. It takes, you know, more than us. So um, the Veterans Office, Harmony House, um, just a lot of the different um, agencies, we kind of come together 
um, figure out what the people need and then, you know, hook them up with different organizations. So we feed, we shelter, we also clothe. We have a donations department. Um, so when folks come in, they can get clothing um, as well as, you know, we take shoes, books, um, furniture. Um, and so, you know, if they get the job um, or have an interview, we can set them up with interview clothes and then, you know, maybe, a, you know, job or clothes that they would need to wear at their job. And um, hopefully when they get housing, we also try to help them set up their apartment, whether that be with um, a bed or a table, lamps, chairs. So we are open to you know, take anything that you pretty much want to donate. We don't take appliances. That's about the only thing. But um, our donations department's open Monday through Friday, and you can um, drop that stuff off um, if you would like. Um, so we feed, shelter, clothe. And then, um, you know, our goal is to focus on the whole person. So not only just physically, emotionally, mentally, but um, also spiritually. So um, we have a chapel, and we have two chaplains. And um, that is open to the community as well as our guests who stay with us. Um, and one of the main focuses of our chapel is our Transformers Recovery Program. And um, that's been in existence for about three years now. We've had 11 graduates. It's a 12-month program for anyone um, in um, addiction. And it's Christ-centered. Um, so they go through um, the 12 steps of Jesus, um, discipleship, service, and then, you know, as they move along, work on getting um, a job as well as housing. And so would Michael share his story? I'm Michael. I had drugs and alcohol and addiction and that's what you mean homeless. Arriving in the mission, I heard about a transport recovery program. Since being admitted to that program, I'm sober and have had a new sense of responsibility. I'm currently working two jobs. Have saved over a thousand dollars and have been reunited with my daughter. Last Friday, I completed 12 months in the Transformer Recovery Program and became a graduate. Yeah, Michael's our newest graduate of the Transformers Recovery Program and is doing really well. Um, and so we're just, um, so we kind of feed, shelter, clothe, and, um, you know, um, focus on the spiritual aspect as well and just hope that when people come that, you know, they get a little bit of hope because um, hope, you know, can help them and, um, you know, just that we share the love of Christ with them as well. Um, but I just, again, want to thank you and everyone hopefully um, got a card and that's just sort of a thank you for our let's do lunch. But also on the back is our information if you want to give or donate. Um, and we'd love to have you come over. Um, just call us up, come over, have a tour, you know, and maybe meet some of these folks that um, we share their story. And, um, you know, if you want to volunteer, just get a hold of me. But all the information there is on the back. And again, just thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jody. Now, if you uh, want to follow me in your Bibles, either in your actual leather-bound uh, Bibles or your various and sundry electronic devices, we're going to be looking at the 23rd Psalm today. I love the 23rd Psalm. Uh, we don't know exactly at what point of David's life that he wrote it. In my mind, I want to picture him as a shepherd boy out in the night, maybe after a... a uh, 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 you know, a, a tough experience one evening and uh, experiencing and and just uh, feeling the uh, the presence of God and how that he uh, took care of him. I want to see him as that uh, little boy pinning this. But when he did it, we don't exactly know. But here's what I'm finding out. The older I get, the more I learn. And that's true. But I also realize the more I learn the more I don't know as much as I thought that I knew. I'm learning that. Are you like that? And then uh, what I find is that there are nuggets of gold in Scripture, and very often they are hidden in plain view. In those passages that we are most familiar with, we have a tendency to breeze by gold nuggets that are there, and can, can uh, enrich our life and feed us. And this 23rd Psalm is one of them. For whatever reason, I have been 
stuck there for it seems like a few months and I've been meditating in it and just uh, and the Lord I think has been uh, teaching uh, me some things there. We're not going to look at the entire psalm today but I want you to follow with me as we read the first three verses. I'm reading from the New King James Version today and it says the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And it's hard not to just read that whole thing, but I want to stop right there. And I want to focus on the first four words of verse three. Been there the whole time over a thousand years, but I have to say I've never really focused on it like I have lately, and the first four words are, He restores my soul. And I want us to just focus there for a little while today. Let's talk about the soul. And when we talk about the soul, the first images that conjure up in my imagination is this more mystical part of us. This more uh, it's more effervescent and it's hard maybe to exactly put your finger on it. And in reality, uh, that's not uh, exactly what David intended here. When he says soul in verse 3, the word, and I feel funny even saying this in this, uh, in this uh, uh, sacred space here, but it's the Hebrew word nephesh. And it's a really interesting word. It has to do with the idea, we most commonly see it translated as soul, but it's also the idea of a living being. It has to do with life, the self, the person, our desires, our passions, our appetites. It's a word quite literally that means the throat. And if you consider that, the things that both uh, sustain and, and, uh, and, and help our life are the things that come through the throat. Not only the water that we drink and not only the food that we eat, but also the very air that we breathe. But it goes beyond that idea of the throat. For instance, in Genesis 2, 7, here's what the scripture says. And the Lord God, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living what? Being. Very good. Uh, the older translations say soul, but the word is nephesh. So God formed Adam from the dust of the ground and he shaped him and formed him to look like what we know now as a, as a, a physical human being. But in reality, he was nothing but dust. He was uh, probably like Michelangelo's David made in, out of marble, but he was just a, a, a form of a man until God breathed into him and then he became a living nephesh, a living being, a, a, a person, a, a self. When we think of the soul, you should think of the idea of the intellect, the emotion. That's a key word, emotion, and the will. So as we look at that, uh, think of it this way. Think of it as the, as the whole human, the, a living physical being. Don't think of it as a soul trapped inside of a body or the ghost in the machine. Don't think of it that way. Don't, but think of it as the whole of the person. And again, in this space here, uh, these two verses have probably been read uh, countless times, but from Deuteronomy 6 and what we know uh, as the Shema, Moses writes, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, or with all of your nephesh, and with all of your might. So the Shema is about 
devoting and loving God with the entirety of ourself, with the entirety of our being, both the physical, and if you want to refer to it this way, and the spiritual. So if I were you and I were sitting back and listening to this, and if you, if you haven't already checked out and you're still listening, then I, here's the question that I would be asking, and that is this. So why would my soul, or why would my nephesh, why would that need to be restored? And we can understand if it's the body, if you have need of an operation, the, a physical thing, you can see that. They go in, they you know, unzip you, and they go in and cut out the bad thing, get rid of it, you know, get you fixed up, restore you uh, to a certain extent. And that way we can understand that. But why would our soul need to be repaired or restored? Like a beautiful classic car that's been hidden in a barn for 40 years, beat up, scratched, abused, lost its shine and its luster. The interior cracked and decayed, moss growing up in the, the gears and the drive shaft and all of that, exhausted. But like that, being pulled out of the barn, repaired, repainted, restored to its fullest potential. And if you watch those shows like I watch, then you know that uh, those auctions, then you know that once that happens, not only does it look good, not only does it sound good, but also the value of that has greatly increased. You understand what I'm saying? I saw this one the other day. I don't know if it was Barrett's, Meacham's or whatever, and it was some kind of Camaro. I don't know. I've always been more of a Mustang man myself, but it was some kind of Camaro and it sold for over $200,000. And I'm thinking that when that thing was brand new, it was probably less than $10,000. And now it's 200,000. And why is it worth that? Because it has been restored, not only to its original uh, place, but actually improved upon. And that is what the shepherd, the Lord, does to our souls. And here's a better illustration, quite truthfully. You remember when Jesus says, talks, talking about a good shepherd, and he will leave the 99 that are saved in the fold, and he will go out and find that one that's lost. You remember that passage? And what does he do? He picks it up and he brings it back and he restores it. He places it back with the rest of the flock. When I was a pastor of a country church many years ago, we came out of church one Sunday, and there were farms all around us, uh, including one that was right beside the church, and there was just this little lamb that was wandering around in front of the church. And of course, we all that was the greatest thing that had happened to us in a long time. But we had a fellow there who was a farmer, and he realized that this is a, a kind of a grave situation here. And he got that little lamb, and he knew how to hold it. And he knew uh, the gravity of the situation, that this lamb was away from the protection of the rest of the flock. And he knew the vulnerability of this little lamb. And he cuddled this little thing, and he, and he picked it up, carried it, in his bosom, if you will, and he crossed the fence line and carried that little lamb to where the rest of that flock was, and he restored it to the flock, and he brought it there and left it there where it belonged, back to the place of safety. <clears throat> Bear with me. I, like probably 90% of you, and dealing with the, uh, the local thing that we get every this, uh, this time of year, That friend of mine, even though that wasn't his sheep, those weren't his sheep, and that wasn't his farm, 
that friend of mine acted like the shepherd. He acted like the good shepherd to restore to potential, to safety, that little lamb. And think about what we're talking about here. We're not necessarily even talking about when Jesus saves us and uh, when he brings us into to, uh, oneness with him and reconciliation with him, not, not necessarily even talking about that. We are talking about the very soul within you, that intellect, emotion, will, that person, that being that is inside of you, being restored just like that little lamb was restored. That's the work of the shepherd, to restore us to our true potential, not just eternal life, but abundant life. Man, we don't get that. And that is so important. Not just living. Do you ever think that life seems to be nothing more than just getting up, going to work, paying bills, and then dying? You ever think that? But Jesus is promising us more than that. He promises us abundant life, a full life, a complete life. I want to read to you from Albert Barnes' notes on this verse right here. Okay, so bear with me. Just a couple of paragraphs that's worth reading. Literally, he says, <coughs> he causes my life to return. He quickens me to cause me to live. When our spirit is exhausted, weary, or sad, the meaning is that God quickens or vivifies the spirit when it is thus exhausted. Now, I'm going to ask you to bear with me about one other thing, too. And that is, I am actually going to try to talk to you and keep this cough drop in my mouth. So, you folks on the first three rows may want to move back. I don't want anyone losing an eye because I get excited up here and the cough drop goes, okay? So here's the next paragraph, and it's worth reading. The reference is not to the soul as wandering or backsliding from God, listen, but to the life or spirit as exhausted, wearied, troubled, anxious, worn down, with care and toil, the heart thus exhausted. Let me, let me put my finger and stop right there. Uh, is there anybody in here today who identifies with that? Anybody here today who can identify with your soul being exhausted, weary, troubled, anxious? Worn down with toil and care. Exhausted. I like that word. I'm a, I'm a child of the late 60s, early 70s. And in that time, Jackson Brown wrote a song, looking out at the road rolling under my wheels, looking back at the years gone by like so many summer fields. In 69, I was 17. I might have the, verse, the, the numbers wrong there. Running up, run on one. And I don't know how that road turned onto the road I'm on. Running on empty. Man, I've done that, haven't you? Running on, running on fumes. Well, that's who he's speaking to. He reanimates it. He brings back its vigor. He encourages it. He excites it. And he fills it with new joy. He restores my soul. If you didn't know by now, you should know that our God is in the soul restoration business. He does that for us. And in this modern day that we live in, with its advanced technologies, advanced medical abilities, advanced comforts and amenities, the thing that has not advanced but in fact has been threatened and has, is in decline is our mental wellness. Did you know that among the homeless population is estimated that 40% 
suffer from some type of mental illness, and 25% suffer from some severe type of of mental illness. And the thing that I am not reading about it or hearing about today, you know, it seems like we always lag behind the uh, opioid epidemic was going on for a long time before we heard anything about it. And this, in my opinion, is the next thing that you'll hear about. And that is the fact that the amount of mental illness among our homeless population, especially, seems to be growing tremendously. And we see it in the mission. We see it every day. It seems to be growing worse and worse and worse. Um, we have a dear lady right now um, who um, I'm, 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 I'm holding back here because of confidentiality. And I, there's only so many things I can say, but she does the best carpenter songs as praise and worship that you have ever heard. And, um, she is uh, one of the, uh, the ones we worry about the least. It's honest, and not just in the homeless population, but to us as well. Many of you today are going through some type of issue that's challenging you, your self, your person, your well-being. I think of the woman that was left at the mission with four kids when the husband went out to, to get a newspaper or whatever it was and never showed up. I think of the young man who experienced his first episode with anxiety or depression. The mother and father who just found out that your child is addicted to pain pills. Those going through job loss or job threat. Those of you whose marriage is under attack. Those of you who maybe recently have had uh, uh, things affecting your health. And you don't know the outcome of it yet. Remember this, that the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But remember this again, that the good shepherd... The shepherd of our souls says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And let's talk about this and close with this. Who is it that is able to restore our souls? We look at that third verse and it says, he restores my soul. Who is he? And you go to the, thir the first verse and it starts out, the Lord is my shepherd. It's the shepherd who is able to do that. And that shepherd is the Lord. Let's drill down a little further than that. And again, if we look back in the uh, original language and we look at the word Lord and we try to figure out exactly what that is because there are, there are multiple things that are translated as Lord. It is what we hear in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses says, if I go and say to your people that uh, to, to follow me, if I go to Pharaoh and say, let your people go, who is it that I can say sent me? And the voice from the bush that burned that was not consumed said, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am, has sent me to you. What does that mean? It is the eternal, self-existent one that we commonly know in the English as the name Jehovah. That's who the shepherd is in Psalm 23. It is the covenant name of God. It is that name that is relational. It is that name that they, uh, that the, not only uh, those Jewish people, but we as well can look back upon and know that he is our God. He is relational. He is unchanging. And that's who is the shepherd of your soul. And that's who, David says, restores his soul. That's who it is. Um, 
Now, let me just say this and move on. But there's a real correlation between that Old Testament name, Jehovah, and that New Testament name, Jesus. Jesus was in confrontation with some religious leaders in John chapter 8. And finally, he, man, he lowered the boom on them and let them have it. And he said, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And unless you think they just scratched their head and wondered what he was talking about, they knew exactly what he was talking about. And they picked up stones to kill him right then and there because Jesus was saying that I am he, I am God, I am the good shepherd. Jehovah and I are one. And brothers and sisters, he that we sing about today, he that we confessed to, he is the shepherd of your soul. He is the restorer of your soul. I don't know if y'all say ever say amen, but if you do, that would be a good place to say it right there. <laughs> I mean, uh, the old Pike County, Kentucky boy and me is wanting to hoop and holler up here to do something like that. <laughs> but Jesus, Jesus, our savior, Jesus, who gives us eternal life. Jesus, who gives us abundant life. Jesus, who never leaves us, never forsakes us. And despite what is causing your soul to need restoration today, He is with us. And He is able to pull that old 69 Chevelle out of the barn and clean it up and restore it and fix the interior and clean off the, the calling card from the chickens that's on it. And he's able to do all of that and restore it and bring it back to where it rolls across the line at Meacham's and somebody doesn't see an old worn out rusty car now. They see something that they want to pay $200,000 for because they see the value that's in it. Are you following me today? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The word want there would probably be better translated lack. I think of wants. I got a list of them. But what, the, what David is saying is, he is my shepherd and I will not lack for anything. He makes me. He makes me. Do you see that? He makes me. Lie down in green pastures. I don't want to. I'm like a three-year-old. I'm like a three-year-old that's fighting sleep. I've never seen a three-year-old yet go, look at the time. I should be at nap right now. <laughs> so long, mother. Like that three-year-old fighting sleep, I think I know what's best for me. And so I don't lay down in the green pastures when I should, but he makes me lie down in the green pastures. And then he leads me beside the still waters. And he even leads me in paths of righteousness. And he does it for his name's sake, for his reputation. He leads me beside the still waters and quenches my thirst. And when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I love the movement there. I don't go in there and stand. I don't go in there and stay. I don't go in there and meditate. But I'm walking through that valley of the shadow of death. And when I do it, he is with me. And then when I'm surrounded by those who would destroy me, when they think they have me at siege and that there is no hope for me, he comes down right in the middle of the wilderness. And he spreads a table for me like you do for an honored guest. And when my throat, my nephesh, is dried up and seems like it will be destroyed, man, he fills my cup up until it runs over. That's who restores your soul. That's who can do it for you. And that's who I pray that you will 
lean on today to do that. Let's bow our heads together. Father, you, the shepherd of our souls, Lord, you know our innermost being. There is not a thought, the psalmist said. There is not a thought that we think or a word that we say that you don't already know it from a great way off. You know what needs to be restored and healed as well as what needs to be cut away and discarded. Forgive us, Lord, for believing that we can do this on our own. We know that you want to restore us. And I pray today that across this building with these wonderful folks here, that you would help us to yield to you to do that. Do that, Lord, so that we can serve you and bring honor and glory to you and testify and be able to say that if it had not been for the Lord in our life during this rough spot that we're in, if it had not been for you, then we surely, surely, surely would have been consumed and destroyed. Help us to lean on the good shepherd who comes to give us life and give it to us abundantly. May we stop living under our circumstances and start living to the identity of who we are in you. And we ask all of that in Jesus' name and amen.